Okay, so thank you again, Philip, uh, and welcome everyone from me as well. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is Swift UI. Most of you have probably already heard of Swift UI, but I'm actually curious to know how many of you have had the chance to work with it. Uh, would you be kind enough to raise a hand if you have? Okay, cool. We have actually plenty of people that wasn't as expected. Um, but before we dive deeper into the details of Swift UI, let's get rid of some concerns first. Does Swift UI replace UI Kit? The short answer is no. Uh, the longer answer would be that there are plenty of reasons why that's not the case. One of those reasons is that there are a lot of features uh, that are part of Swift UI that are actually built on top of UIKit. And such example is Swift UI's list that actually uses UI table view in the background. Another reason is that not everything is fully or correctly implemented in Swift UI, at least not yet. And unfortunately, the Swift UI's native navigation is an example of this. And we'll talk about it a bit, uh, a bit more uh, later about it. And the third and final reason is that uh, UIKit won't simply be replaced thanks to Apple. Apple is constantly improving, Swift, uh, is improving UIKit, sorry, and adding new features to it. The last uh, changes were actually uh, announced on last year's Apple's conference. This, however, doesn't stop us from uh, gradually integrating Swift UI into our existing projects that use UIKit. Uh, this can be done thanks to Apple's wrappers, uh, which allow, uh, allows, uh, allow us to use Swift UI inside UIKit code, and of course, the other way around. In order to use Swift UI in your projects, you have to support minimum version iOS 13, so that's the official requirement. Of course, there are other versions for the other platforms, but since we're talking about mobile, our personal recommendation is to start with at least iOS 14. The reason for this is pretty simple and also quite logical if you think about it. Uh, since iOS 13 is the first version that allows us to use Swift UI, it's expected to be buggy, it's expected not to work flawlessly, and also a lot of features are missing. Uh, if you can go for a higher version, do so because there are features that are available from iOS 15 and above, or even iOS 16, but start with at least iOS 13. Now, finally, we get to the part where we talk about Swift UI. So Swift UI is a fairly new framework that's used as a declarative way of designing user interfaces. The developers need to specify how the UI should look and behave, and Swift UI takes care of the rest. So displaying animations, stuff like that, Swift UI does that for us. Uh, Swift UI also greatly simplifies the state management, and we'll take a look at it in the next slide as well. But that means that the, the displayed content on screen matches the data that's behind it. Uh, it's also cross-platform, so that's one great thing about it. Uh, so that means if you design a user interface for, for one platform, you can easily use the same one for another. Regarding the state and data flow, uh, this is a simplified diagram that explains how that's working in the background. So whenever we have an action that mutates the state, changes the data, uh, it actually triggers Swift UI to update and re-render the view. Uh, that blue part that you can see happens every time there is a change in the data. Uh, this action can be anything from a user interaction, so a button tap, uh, if the user has entered some text in a text field, uh, or anything that the user interacts with on the user interface, as well as an external event, so a publisher emitting a value, an alarm going off, and so on. Uh, for this to work, Swift UI offers uh, property wrappers, uh, observed objects, state binding, publish. These are only some of them. There are actually plenty of them, and each of them has their own use case. So whenever you annotate a property with one of these, you tell Swift UI to listen to these properties and update the UI accordingly. Since we've talked about UI Kit and now uh, about Swift UI, uh, regarding the battle of these two, these are some things that are worth mentioning. Uh, UIKit's view controllers can become quite large uh, through the project's life and therefore are very difficult to maintain. The source control changes are hard to review with the interface builder files, and also these 
Uh, these IB files don't really know much about our code with the exception of IB outlet and IB uh, action. Also another setback was that we had to use strings to identify objects. So whenever we needed to uh, instantiate a view controller, use a storyboard, we needed to use the string that identifies that object. And of course, as you already know, working with strings is not really type proof and errors can and of course did occur from time to time. And the last part about UIKit is that it actually has a lot of boilerplate code, um, which is the result of subviews and adding, uh, adding subviews and adding constraints uh, when we're doing user interface programmatically. On the other side, we have Swift UI that uh, makes things way simpler. It also uses the full range of Swift functionalities. Um, so functionalities that previously weren't used or weren't used enough are now finally getting to shine. Um, combine is here in the picture, uh, function builders, um, and so on. Also the property wrappers that I mentioned before are also here. It also puts the argument to rest about storyboards or programmatic UI since Swift UI is fully down through code. And the way that we can see what we're designing is through the previews. And because of this, it's an extremely fast and also effective way of building user interfaces. Now, since the architecture of choice here at Infinum is Viper, uh, it's only natural to talk about how these two work together. In order to use SwiftUI with Viper, we did have to modify the previously explained Viper architecture. And the main reason for this is that the views are no longer reference types or classes, but are in fact view types, uh, are, are in fact value types uh, or structs. That means that the presenters can't hold a reference to the views anymore, but the views have the reference to the presenter. Uh, as Philip explained, here's what the, uh, what the previous architecture looks like. And the part that we're interested in is the communication between the view and the presenter. So because the presenter doesn't have a reference to the view anymore, the communication in that direction is uh, not existing anymore. And the other way around, it still persists. But although this might seem like a problem, it actually isn't because Swift UI takes care of this for us. The enforced changes uh, in the Viper architectures, uh, sorry, in the Viper architecture are the following. So the presenter uh, conforms to the observable object protocol, and it also contains published properties. Uh, these published properties are the ones that drive the UI changes. Um, it's also uh, worth noting that the observable object and published, they have to, they go in pair. They, you have to use them together. So. The published properties won't work without observable object and vice versa, the observable object protocol doesn't really make much sense without uh, the published properties. Since the presenter inherits from observable object, the reference that the view has of it is wrapped with observed object. The rest of the layers, they remain the same and are used as before. Here we can see an example of the presenter. As said before, it conforms to observable object. And in this example, we have a single published property, which is of type string. This means that whenever this property gets changed, the UI will also change to match it. Uh, and what's uh, interesting here is that we have a computed property is button disabled. And even though this property depends on the published property, it's not driving the UI, it just depends on it. In the view, we have the reference to the presenter uh, that's wrapped with observed object. And through this reference, we can access all of the properties and the methods in the presenter. As you can see, uh, next to the published property, we actually have a dollar sign. Uh, that's because we're binding here. We're binding the text to the text field uh, to the to the presenter's published property group name. So what this code does, uh, simply put, is whenever the user enters some text in the text field, uh, the button either gets enabled or disabled. Now, if you notice, we actually use the presenter uh, and not uh, an interface of it. Does anybody maybe know why? Anyone? 
Okay, so the idea is that since we're using in the presenter, wait, I can go back, we're using this observable object protocol, we can't really use an interface of it. We have to use the actual presenter. So we can, because we're observing the actual presenter, that's the object we're observing, not some interface that doesn't really do anything. Um, now, now we have Swift UI screens and also UI kit screens, um, both perfectly functional. So how do we mix them in an app? This is where lazy hosting view controller is used. That's a custom implementation of UI hosting view controller, and it's used to wrap Swift UI uh, views. It acts as a bridge between UIKit and Swift UI, and uh, what it does, it's it lazily loads Swift UI views. Why it's called lazy, we'll actually take a look at that uh, a bit later. But the good thing about it is that it's UIKit based, and that means that we can use UIKit's navigation uh, with new, uh, UI navigation controller. Uh, here's what the implementation looks like. Uh, the root view that we have is the Swift UI view we're trying to host. And in the view did load uh, lifecycle method, we instantiate a UI hosting controller and we set its root view to be our Swift UI view uh, or the root view in this case. We add the subviews, we add the constraints that we need, and basically that's how the view gets hosted. Um, the important part is that it's quite generic because we want to use it for every type of Swift UI view that we create. Uh, the way it's used is also pretty simple. It's used in the wireframe. Uh, so in the initializer, we create a lazy hosting view controller, and we set the type to be uh, of the view we want. In this situation, is landing view since we're in the landing wireframe. Uh, then to that module, uh, module view controller, we set its root view to be an instance of the landing view, and we also pass it a reference to the presenter. And here we can see why it's called lazy. It's not in a rush to host the view. Uh, it actually does that after, um, after, initializing landing, uh, after initializing the interactor and presenter. Since we mentioned the navigation twice already, uh, we use wireframes instead of Swift UI's native navigation uh, because for now it's better than the native navigation. Uh, it did get improved though over the course of time, but we opted out of using it and we use UI navigation controller as a navigation basis and all of our Swift, U, uh, Swift UI views are wrapped with the lazy hosting view controller so we can uh, yeah, basically insert them into the UI kit hierarchy. Uh, we've talked about how we can um, use UIKit and Swift UI modules in one project, but what happens when we have pre-existing UIKit components, perfectly functional, and we just want to use them in a Swift UI module? Uh, one way to do it is the obvious, uh, refactor the whole component to Swift UI, which is totally valid, but sometimes we might not want to do that. And we actually can do it without, refact uh, without refactoring, and that's with using UI view representable. And to make our lives even easier, we created a custom Swift UI wrapper. And that wrapper looks like this. It conforms to UI view representable, and in order to do so, it has two methods, the make UI view and the update UI view. The make UI view is responsible, it, it gets called the first time that the view gets presented, and the update UI view is responsible for configuring and updating the view as the name suggests. Its usage is pretty straightforward. So we're wrapping our UI kit view, and this example is titled value accessory view, and then we initialize it in whichever way the UI kit component was supposed to be initialized. Then to this view, we can do whatever is valid to do to a regular Swift UI view. So we can add padding uh, as we did here. We can overlay another component. We can set the width, the frame, play with it. Like you can do whatever you want. We've bragged about how good Swift UI is, which it is, don't get me wrong, but of course not everything about it is nice and shiny and we did encounter some issues with it. One of those issues was with hiding the navigation bar. So when we tried to push one view controller, hide the navigation bar, then push another view controller and show the navigation bar, it actually didn't work as expected. So the solution was to hide it in the base navigation controller class. We also noticed that when we use scroll view proxy, the list is acting 
weird. There's also this specific bug on iOS 16 uh, with the sheet presentation background. So when you're presenting a sheet, you can see how it goes kind of narrower, it jumps up, it's visible, not very pretty. And also there's the problem that there are features that are not available in Swift UI, at least not yet. Some of them are uh, disabling scroll in scroll view, resigning first responders, uh, the text field focus is not really working unless you delay it for a second, and the list goes on. Actually, we'd love to hear more about the issues that you've encountered and how you solve them after this presentation, even maybe in, uh, in the questions and answers part. Uh, so with that, we conclude the presentation about this part. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your attention and joining us.